My name is Imma Vitali. I'm a foreign correspondent. I'm a war correspondent. I've been coming here on and off to talk about Syria a lot. Last fall, I talked about the siege of Aleppo, and it wasn't pretty. I guess it won't be pretty tonight either, but at least there is some light on the things that I will share with you this evening. Because we're talking about war, which is the war in Syria, of course, and women. The war in Syria, as you all know, has reached its sixth year. It started the revolution in March 2011, and, and within a few months it became just a very cruel war, a repression. It was an insurgency repressed by the government with planes against people. So six years on, since we talk about Syria, I should start by saying, what's the situation like? And the situation has produced a division. Syria is no longer united. Syria, right now, as it stands, is divided in different parts. The colors on the screen that you probably can see um, can give you an idea of what is the situation on the ground right now. The yellow in the north is Kurdish control. And then you have the pink and then um, the, gray, the, the green, or grayish, yeah, the green. So, so the pink is this array of opposition forces that we call Free Syrian Army. And then we have the pink, uh, we have the gray that is the government. As you can see, Aleppo right now um, is gray because it fell in December, just before Christmas. What we're going to focus on this evening is the north, where, as you can see, and then, you, and then you, of course you have ISIS, Islamic State, okay? The Islamic State that right now um, has still its capital, its so-called capital, Raqqa, and then it still hangs on to some parts of the province of Deir ez-Zor and also Asaka, okay? So the gray is the Islamic State, and then you have the Kurds in yellow. The Kurds. Who are they? What do we know about the Kurds? There are a lot of people. There are a lot of people who are Kurdish. We're talking about something like 35 million people. It's a lot of people. If you think about a state like Lebanon, it's 4 million people. Okay? We're talking about 35 million people in different countries. In Iran, in Iraq, in Syria, in Turkey. In Turkey, we have something like between 20 and 22 million Kurds. It's a tremendous amount of people who never had the state for different reasons. They do have a language in common, a religion in common, they're mostly Sunni Islam, they have different creeds, but they never had the state. At a certain point, it seemed like after World War I, after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, it seemed like, you know, it was going to happen, but then, of course, colonial powers made a promise, and then they said, actually, our promise is vacant, it doesn't mean anything, it's empty, so they didn't get their state, so they were kind of fights, rebellions that lasted for a while and then subsued and then you still have these 20 million people that are the largest ethnic minority in Turkey, they have no basic rights. This is important if we want to understand what's happening here in northern Syria because as you can see, northern Syria and where these Syrian Kurds are is on the border with Turkey, where Turkish Kurds are. So geography is very important. And then, if you look at this other map, okay, this is Turkey. There is Iraq here, there is Kurdistan. There is Iraqi Kurdistan on the border, where there are other Kurds, something like eight million. We're talking about the people here, okay? They had no rights. They had no possibility of being who they were really, you know, as a people with their religion, with their tradition, with their creeds. Um, in Turkey, they were called Turks of the High Plains or Turks of the Mountains. The oppression has been really, 
really bad and really um, across the board, even in northern Syria, where they are 10% of the population. Before the war, before 2011, this 10% of the population used to live in Damascus and Aleppo. And then there were in these three separated cantons in northern Syria that you see here on the map. This Kamishli, Kamishli Afri, Afrin and Kobane. And then when the war started, they kind of looked what was happening, you know. Again, we're talking about dispossession, people who had no rights, okay? They kind of looked around. And then eventually, in 2014, they declared an autonomous region, and they called it Rojava in the north. Why, all in a sudden, the Kurds are on the front lines of northern Syria battling ISIS? And why I'm here this evening talking about female Kurdish fighters battling ISIS. So you have the most misogynist, cruel uh, force that appeared on the horizon in our times, fighting, on the other hand, on the front lines, on trenches against women. Now, we all know that in the Middle East, women are not, do not enjoy a tremendous amount of rights. We all know that women have it very tough in many places in the world, but if there is a place in the Arab world, in, in the Middle East, if there is a place in the world where women have it particularly tough, that's the Middle East. It's, of course, it's a problem of modernity, I'm not gonna get there, but the idea in a place, in a region like the Middle East, of having women fighting, it's quite amazing and surprising and counterintuitive. And, and, and it goes against everything I knew about the region where I lived for a long time. So at the beginning I thought, ah, uh, this thing, it might be just propaganda. Before I went in, I went, I went, I went in several times in northern Syria, and I spent a lot of time with the Kurds, because at this point, for a reporter like me to go to Syria, you can only enter through the north with the Kurds, because the government doesn't give you a visa, doesn't give me a visa because I'm on a blacklist, and the Frisian army is unreliable, I might get kidnapped, not good. And the Kurds are quite reliable. So at the beginning, when I heard about Kurdish women fighting, and before I actually got there, I was looking at the pictures, I was reading some stories, and I thought, this goes against everything I know about the region, how can this be possible? And then I started reading, and the numbers are quite important because we're talking about the force in northern Syria of something like 25,000 fighters, female fighters. Now, you have to know that what happened in northern Syria once the war started for real is that there was a party. There, there are some parties in northern Syria, in Kurdish Syria, that declared autonomy back in 2014. And these parties that declared autonomy then had an armed wing. And the armed wing is called YPG, the, 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 the Syrian Kurdish Protecting Units. And these Syrian Kurdish Protecting Units have a like amount of about 90,000 fighters. So if we're talking about 25,000 of them being women. And I was like, wow, this is really amazing. This is really strange. This is what's going on. And I thought it was propaganda. I thought, you know, these guys are really clever. They're putting the women on their pictures and this is the way they can cozy up to the Western press. We do like women, we do like the idea of a movement for women's rights. Is this for real? I was kind of having my doubts. But then, if you look at this picture, this woman is Rojda Felat. And right now, as you may know, as the fight, the gruesome fight for Mosul is going on, and there is, as we speak, a fight door to door in West Mosul, where people are getting killed, probably while we speak, and where, as you know, the coalition and Trump's administration probably killed more than 200 people in one single neighborhood because airstrikes are no more thought over as they used to be. And it seems like America is turning Russia on Mosul. So it's doing what Russia did in Aleppo, really, but I'm meandering. But there is also looming 
not only the fight for Mosul, but also the fight for Raqqa. Raqqa, as I said at the beginning, is the so-called capital of the Islamic State in Syria. So we're talking about Mosul, most important city in Iraq. That was where Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the leader of ISIS, declared a khilafa, a caliphate, in June 2014 in the Nur Mosque. Okay? And then there is Raqqa, which they declared their capital in northeast Syria. So the battle for Mosul is going on. Also, the battle for Raqqa is going on. And right now, the Kurds, with some minor free, free Syrian army allies, but basically the Kurds in Syria are encircling Raqqa. Their name is Syrian Defense Forces, but basically they're a Turkish, uh, uh, they are also Turkish, but they're Kurdish force. They're 20 kilometers from Raqqa. They took an air base that was very important in Tabqa last Sunday, three days ago. Any moment, the battle to take Raqqa might begin. They said at the very beginning of April. We're talking about the next few days, maybe weeks, we don't know. And who's the commander of these Syrian Democratic Forces? who will launch the assault on Raqqa, this woman. Her name is Roja Felat. Now you're looking at all of this and you're saying, okay, this is like what's going on, there is something that I'm missing here, I want to understand. That was how I felt when, after spending time with the Free Syrian Army and with the fighters and with the rebels and they were all men and there was never a woman and hanging out in, dilapidated schools and the front lines that I had never seen a woman and then in a sudden I crossed into northern um, Syria and the first time I had my encounter with these women was in Kobane. <laughs> and that was quite incredible because as you remember Kobane was this town on the border with Turkey where ISIS took the first defeat that started its descent. ISIS lost since its peak in June 14 when Baghdadi launched the, the idea of the caliphate, 65% of its territory. It's a lot of territory, 65%. And the beginning of this curve of this descent started in Kobane. So I arrived there. I crossed into Turkey from Suruç, which is the Kurdish town on the border with Turkey. I, I thought I had to kind of crawl in, inside the hole in the barbed wire. <laughs> As I did to go to Aleppo, I didn't need to do that. I kind of walked across the border and Kobane was an apocalyptic place. The fights, one of the things we do not get being far away from these places is that the fighting that is going on both in Iraq and Syria is urban fighting. Door to door, it's pretty bad. Um, it means literally that there are snipers all over the place and the curtains that you see here were the curtains that the locals used in the middle of a street to protect themselves from sniper fire. So it was very possible that on the other side of the curtains, you might have a Daesh, a nice sniper, and on this side, you would have a Kurdish fighter running around trying to figure out how to get the sniper. And then, of course, what the turning point of the fight for Kobane was the coalition where the airstrikes U.S. airstrikes. By the time I got there, 70% of the city laid in ruins, pretty much like this. There were bodies all over the place. 2,000 dash, 2,000 ISIS fighters who were no longer alive, to be polite. And the price that the city paid for liberation and, and this, it is today the price that Mosul is paying, and it is today the price that Raqqa is paying, is enormous, because what winners call victory or liberation, in fact, is destruction. And there, um, 
I asked my Kurdish guide to meet the commander, and I had no idea who the commander was. And I have to be honest, I, my idea was not even to get in there and do a story about the Kurdish women. It, it just happened. I asked, I want to meet the commander, and then I waited, and I waited, and I waited, and it was cold, and it was destruction, and it was, you know, bombing, and it's never pleasant, a war zone. But then at midnight, at a certain point, the guide came over, my Kurdish interpreter, and he said, let's go, you're good to go, let's go, let's go. Where are we going? We're going to meet Commander Maryam. There was a picture of Commander Maryam, and then I realized that this is going to be online, and so I took the picture. She doesn't want to appear. I only had one picture, I took it off. I realized Commander Maryam is this woman between 40 and, 60, and 50, very serious, a tough woman. She was the commander of all Kurdish forces who liberated Kobana. I was kind of, duh, this is very interesting. You are the one who did this. Yes, of course, American strikes had tremendously and killed a tremendous amount of Daesh, but basically for more than a month, they were alone defending Kobana. They only had AK-47 against truck bombings, artillery, and you name it, you know suicide bombers, who were crossing from Turkey because Turkey for a long time sided with Daesh, with ISIS. So I'm there and I'm talking to this woman, I'm trying to inter... I'm just like, I understand she doesn't trust me because she doesn't know me, so I, I, I try not to ask too many questions at the very beginning. And I keep my notebook in my pocket because the moment I, my notebook is out, she sees it and I understand the psychology of the woman and she thinks, okay, she has to mind her words and and so i needed her to relax so i we had probably three or four five or six teas i don't know if you're familiar with the middle east you know that you need to drink a lot of teas and a lot of coffee in order for people to relax and finally kind of tell you the stories and then she just started telling me these stories that were quite incredible and it's, and all of a sudden i realized that in fact there were women on the front line battle in isis and the reason why they kept kobane and kobane was this turning point in northern syria against the fight against you know isis was this crucial moment and this crucial moment was determined by a troop of women on a, on a northern front line in Kobane, because the moment there was this surprise attack, this woman said, no one leaves, we're going to fight and defend Kobane, and Kobane is not going to fall until we have a house. And I was listening to her. I'm getting the goosebumps right now while I'll tell you the story, because I did get the goosebumps while I was listening to her. And she was telling me, they all were calling me on my walkie-talkie, and I said, no one leaves, we're all there, and they were completely overwhelmed, and she says, Destina, this girl from Suleimania, she called, and she said, Commander, not to worry, you know, ISIS is going to take over our front line only if we all die. And I'm like, this is quite incredible, isn't it? It is quite incredible. And I tried to understand. And she was telling me stories and stories and stories. And she said, you know, my women know what happens if ISIS gets them, if they capture them. They know. One of my fighters, she was captured, raped, beheaded, and their picture, uh, the picture of her head ended up on ISIS social networks and social media. And it wasn't pretty. And so whenever my girls got to the battle, to the front line, I tell, them, I tell them, and this is my rallying cry, I tell them, do not allow ISIS to cut your hair. She wouldn't say your head. She would say your hair. It was all very nice. It was, no, it was not nice. It was epic, actually. I'd be lying if I said it was nice. It was really epic. There were other girls who were encircled and wounded. And they know the stories at that point. You see, you probably heard the Basinjar and the Yazidi women, right? You probably know that Sinjar is this area in Kurdistan, Iraqi Kurdistan, Kurdish as well. They're Yazidi, Yazidi is their creed, is their faith, but they're Kurdish. They call them the worshippers of the devil, but <laughs> anyway. So in Sinjar, ISIS overrun Kurdish defenses, the local Kurdish forces, the Peshmerga in, nor in northern Kurdistan. And they took over Sinjar, where all these villages where the Yazidi lived, and they kidnapped 
thousands of women and enslaved them. So they raped them and enslaved them. They became their slaves. They raped them and then they sold them too. There was one story that I'll never forget that was told by one of the victims of how there was a Saudi fighter who would have a 12-year-old slave. And he would pray before raping her, thinking that that was an act of God. We're talking about serious sickness here, okay? And these girls knew all about this. Yet, they were there, fighting. The question that was in my mind, when I started, they are having their meal before going to battle. Um, and this is another commander just checking out the front line that was right there, 500 meters away. Um, and this is a woman that I really, really liked. The more I talked to them, because at that point I was intrigued, and I ended up writing a story just about them, and that was not my intention, but at that point my reporting, my goosebumps, <laughs> led me to write a story about them. So I started asking them, where do you come from and why are you here? And they would say, you know, it's the first time in our lives that we are free. They said, you know, if you're a woman in our land, you're a slave of your father, of your family, of your brother, and then of your husband. Getting married is slavery. It's like you're going to jail. Because they're always going to be a man telling you what to do ordering you around. When I started listening to their stories, they were quite compelling. There was a girl who fled. Just, she just left the family and, and went to, knocked on the YPG, on a YPG office, the, the Popular Protections Unit, saying, I want to I enroll, I want to fight, I want to fight. And, and, and this was the case over and over. They just ran away and enrolled because they knew that the Kurdish militia was looking for fighters. Now, one thing that you need to know about the Kurdish militia, both in Turkey and in Syria, because again, there is only one borderline, one line separating a people with a language, a religion, a creed, a culture, a tradition in common. And they don't call northern Syria or south, southeast Turkey or northeast Syria. They say North Kurdistan, South Kurdistan, East Kurdistan. This is, this is the way they call it, okay? The dialect vary, uh, dialects vary, but, but, but they basically can understand each other. So one of the things that you need to know is that in Northern Syria and in Turkey, so in Northeast Syria and in Southeast Turkey, there is a party called PKK. Now, this is a Turkish party. In 1978, because the Kurds' life was so difficult in Turkey, but very, very difficult. I mean, really, like, you know, the Turks of the islands, no rights whatsoever. No rights whatsoever, stigma, unemployment, discrimination, you know, you're not allowed to speak your own language. It was pretty tough. So in 1978, a, a guy named Ocalan launched the party, the Kurdish Workers' Party, Kurdistan worker, Workers' Party. And this party was, at the beginning, fighting for independence. Well, it, not the very beginning, actually. The fight happened six years later, but they launched an insurgency. They went on for 20, more than 20 years, 40,000 people, died, then eventually there was, um, there were negotiations, now they're at war again. But what's important here to understand about the PKK and Ocalan is that this guy, the ideologue, is a Marxist and an atheist. So the Kurds are Sunni, they're Muslims, they're Sunni Muslims like everyone else, but their ideology is not Islamist, it's Marxist. So, <laughs> They called the girls of the PKK 
And then in northern Syria, I realized, in fact, that 80% of the fighters, both male and female, were PKK. So if, as I was saying earlier, if there is one thing that Erdogan is right about is the fact that he, that he's right. I mean, most of the Kurds fighting in northern Syria are, in fact, PKK. And their leader is Ocalan. And Ocalan is in, in a Turkish prison right now on an island of Istanbul. So this is very important. Because they are the, their ideology of liberation is Marxism. They are atheist. None of their religion is there. Then traditionally, so religion is more a tradition, okay? Um, is the fasting during the Ramadan or um, what it used to be, even in other parts um, of, of the Middle East that, that you know, there's a lot of it actually. It's like these crazy guys do not represent by any means the majority of people. And so, <laughs> this is one of the reasons why they call the female fighters of, 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 of the YPG, of the, of, of the Kurdish militia, they call them the virgins of Ocalan because one of the things that is not allowed to them is love. If you, if you marry the fight, and this is because for the families to allow them eventually to accept eventually the fact that their daughters are fighting, they need to be reassured that in a very conservative society, they don't have to deal with the stigma attached to promiscuity. So, so the virgins of Ocala, they, they had to basically, you know, swear, take an oath by saying that they were marrying their cause. They were not um, being promiscuous. And this is what allowed them then to hang out in camps, in occupied, this is on the front line again with guys. Follow. This is this is on 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 a, on a front line in northern Syria. Um, this is about 30 kilometers south of Kobane last year, um, and they're all together. And the the it, it was quite uh, it was quite exciting because the guy cooking basic rice and beans was a guy, and the command a man, and the commander was a was a woman. I got really excited, but um, it's just like unprecedented. I've never seen any, anything like it, you know, where, where women um, traditionally are housewives. Traditionally, in Kurdish women, in Kurdish areas, both in northern Syria and southeast Turkey, women very often are not allowed to go to school, are not allowed to surf the internet, are not allowed to get on a bicycle, are not allowed to have a boyfriend, forget it. <coughs> Illiteracy is something like 60%. In some areas, unemployment is something like 80%. It's as bad as it gets. Women have 5.5 kids each. That's the average. One woman on average has 5.5 kids. Think about that. I met a Kurdish woman who was 30 and her son was 18. Child marriage is rampant, it's all over the place. There are no human rights. A lawyer told me, a lawyer in the Arbakir, the Arbakir is the capital of Kurdish, um, of Kurdish Anatolia, of Kurdish Southeast Turkey. A woman in the Arbakir, a Kurdish woman in the Arbakir told me, you know, we are broken trees. This is the definition of women in our culture, broken trees. We are like broken trees. There is a fam the most famous song, a famous song is his title is, you are either mine or of the black soil. Meaning, if you're not mine, you're dead. They're really treated like worse than donkeys. It, 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 was, it was quite hard to discover that. I discovered this actually before I discovered the fighters. And that gave me the background to understand. Once I was on the front line, I was talking to them. That story, that old story that I reported that was really, really bad, came back. I think it was one of the worst stories I ever reported, actually. I was living in Istanbul back then. And, and I read this piece of news on a local newspaper. And it said, the headline said, that a 16-year-old girl was buried alive. You have to know that honor killings, and you probably know, what they are, right? Honor killings? Honor killings is like when, when men feel they have to defend their honor and the way they think their honor is attacked is when a daughter, a sister, or a wife, or whatever is seen with a man in the streets. That's an attack on their honor. So honor killings in Turkey 
are an enormous problem. We're talking about something more, more than 300 a year. Like, like on average, every day there is a woman who's killed. And, and so I was in Istanbul and I read on the newspaper this item that said that a 16-year-old was buried alive in their courtyard, in, under the chicken, the chicken stand by the father and grandfather. That was, that, that, that was what the newspaper said, but no reporter went there. And I'm like, this is crazy and insane. It just, it's not possible. 16-year-old, for God's sake, it's 2013. I took a plane and I went there. Adiaman. Adiaman is the province. The name of the place was Kahta. And in fact, it was all true. There was this rumor around that Medina, this beautiful young 16-year-old, who was very devout, was never sent to school, was taking Quran lessons. The imam said she was a good girl. There was this rumor around that she was seen talking a few times with a guy. And so the grandfather was a violent man and just beat her in the courtyard of their home. And then the autopsy revealed that the girl had soil in her lungs. It means that when she was buried, under the chicken stand, she was alive. This is, this is what we're talking about, what we're talking about Kurdish women. And this might give you some background on why so many of them are so eager to end up maybe dying on a front line battling the scariest of the enemies, ISIS. Because if you don't understand this background, then you just think it's weird, right? It's like, why would, even in places like Afghanistan or any other place where, where I covered wars, and I covered a, 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 decent, a decent amount of wars all over, I've never seen women on the front lines fighting the way these women were fighting. And they told me, you know, this is our way out. And they said, this is the only time we can be free. This is the only time we can show men and ourselves that we are worthy, that we can actually make a difference. And if you look at this picture, this was also the only time they could mingle together. And this mingling would be not only accepted, but understood and cherished by their community. Some of them told me that they do not, did not want to live the lives of their mothers, that their mothers lived like slaves. <laughs> I really like this girl because <laughs> she fled. So, so, so basically she went and enrolled and um, she, they, they're undergoing, there are different camps all over northern Syria where the first step um, is for them to take one month training. And they're basically, you know, trained to be fit because a lot of them are not fit at all. They can't, in their own towns, they can't even get on a bicycle, right? So they need to run and then they need to learn how to use a gun and they need to learn, you know, discipline and all of that. Some of them, after this first month and then after this first month of training, they're dispatched to different front lines. Right? And the ones who are really capable, and, and apparently they're really good snipers. I don't know why, but apparently they're very good snipers. So the pictures that I showed you in urban fighting, you know, they, 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 are, they are the ones on the rooftops, basically. It's quite amazing. This girl, at a certain point, before being dispatched to the front line, asked for, for permission and went home and took her mother <laughs> to the camp. You know, took her older mother to the camp and he said, you have to see this, Ma. This is my life. This is what I do. And, 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 and uh, well, she said, my mother was not really convinced, but, but at least she pretended she liked the fact that I was fighting. There is a revolution within a revolution. This is what I'm trying to say. The original revolution is no longer a revolution because it's, it's a cruel, unforgiving war. But this, and these women, it's not quite clear what's going to happen to them because, as you know, Turkey is very hostile to the idea of having the Kurds in northern Syria have their autonomous region. Because this is, this is what they want. They understood, you know, history taught them a very hard lesson. They understood that independence was not in the books. 
that independence was never going to happen. So what, what they're asking right now in these enclaves in the north, um, in this area that is 400 kilometers long, where they rule, what they're asking eventually in a Syrian state, whatever it is going to look like, in a Syrian state, whatever territory it is going to have, they're asking for autonomy within a federal state. This is what they want. They want autonomy, political autonomy, they want democracy, and they want human rights. Now, Erdogan is not very happy. Erdogan, the president of Turkey, who, as you know, on April 16th, might become the next sultan of Turkey because the referendum in Turkey is basically quite appalling. I mean, it, it will have unchecked power if the referendum passes. If, if yes, you know, if they, if they accept what he's proposing, he will do whatever he wants. And Erdogan really doesn't like that because he has these 20 million Kurds in Turkey agitating and he knows the PKK, the PKK, Ocalan, they are the ones fighting in Syria. So the last thing he wants is these guys getting serious autonomy in northern Syria because they might, you know, kind of be reinvigorated in, in, in Turkey. So they are up against a huge wall. Yet yeah, they, they do not despair and they're very creative. If Raqqa, if anyone is going to take Raqqa, it's going to be these people. It's going to be these girls. And they are also very creative. They just launched an academy. Their goal is to enroll 100,000 women. And, and now they don't want to just um, train fighters, female fighters. They actually want to teach human rights. They want to teach women, both Kurdish and, and Arab women, um, that they do have rights, that their lives do not necessarily need to be this life sentence. But they're facing tremendous challenges because um, Turkey is now, well, since a year now, but um, almost a year, in northern Syria as well. It's all very complicated, right? So in northern Syria right now, you have the Kurds with minor free Syrian army, other allies, but basically they are the Kurds, supported by America and the coalition with our strikes. Air strikes, okay. Then you have the Turks and Erdogan, Turkish army. They are bombing the Kurds, who are supported by the Americans, you see. But the Americans and Turkey are in NATO. We're all allies. This is all very complicated, right? And, and, and very wrong and very messed up. So if, we, if we're talking about what will come out of this, it's very uncertain. Because, as you know, war freezes everything. There is no progress in war. But these women actually managed somehow, and I think they are the only one, because they all lost so much in terms of lives, more than half a million people, in terms of properties, in terms of treasure. It's like Aleppo. The death of Aleppo was just stunning. But I think 10 years from now, if we're looking at the epic circumstances in which a barbaric group called ISIS was defeated, these girls will not figure in, they will not be in a footnote because what this girl taught me she was 25, her name was Beshank, she was Turkish, I can go back, whatever. She was 25 from Turkey, from Anatolia, and she fled her home. This is the basement of a school. As you know, in a war zone, the field hospitals are everywhere, right? I mean, the hospitals get bombed and you need to find a space somewhere. <laughs> um, where, where it's a bit more protected, in a basement. And she got wounded by a, a dash, by an ISIS sniper. She was really lucky because she was alive and, and, and the bullet didn't really get into her head. 
But she wasn't doing very great. I mean, she was, she was wounded. She was, she was not well. And when I interviewed her, and I thought, okay, this woman almost died, right? She's there, she faced the enemy, and, and I thought, who knows, she's probably, she probably wants to go home as soon as possible. It was just amazing. She was there, she, she, she just started by saying, you know, fight, I have to fight. And she was mimicking the gun. She said, give me a gun, I can't be here. My friends are, my comrades, my comrades are fighting. They're in the front line, I need to be back, I need to be back for the future, for other women, for the martyrs, for all the friends I lost. Let me out of here. Get me out of here. Eh, I think this passion, 10 years from now, maybe a million people will be dead, but there'll be a legacy. There'll be an example. And the example was set by these girls who were totally intrepid and fearless. The Last thing I want to say before I open the floor to questions, I can't move again, but, um, is how this emancipation, this, this drive, really translated in amazing scenes that I, I frankly never seen. You can see them here, they're, they're both girls and guys, and it was noon. Now, if there is one thing or two that I learned about war, is that no one ever in their sane mind attacks at noon. It's just something that you do not do, right? You do not attack at noon. You wait for darkness. No. I'm there, I'm on the front line, a guy starts shooting 82.82 millimeters mortars, and I'm like, this is not good. I'll go in fire and come in fire. They're close. Ice is very close, less than 100 meters. No good, no good. Sure enough, <laughs> I'll go in fire and come in fire. We're getting, we getting hit. They start dancing. They start dancing. And I'm like, they're crazy. No, they were not crazy. They were just having the time of their lives. They start dancing the dabka. The dabka is this very Middle Eastern thing, you know? They dance it in weddings and parties. Before going to fight, they start dancing the dabka, and the women start the ululating, you know? The ululate, it's like they ululate at weddings and funeral. They start screaming, basically. It's this, it's this scary thing. And they start ululating the women because they know that Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the caliph of ISIS, signed this decree saying that the fighters who are killed in battle by a woman, they do not go to paradise and get the virgins. So the way they are notifying the ISIS fighters that the women are coming is by ululating. And this is what they were doing. And, 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 and I thought, that that was the most amazing thing I ever seen on a battlefield. Now I will take your questions, I think. No, they are... In they the other are, areas in the... In Northern... You're talking about Kurdish women or in general? In general. No, in, in, in my experience in, in the Middle East, uh, on, the, on the front line, yes. I mean, you have the regime of Bashar al-Assad who, who, who does have women, but they're kind of, you know, man in traffic, handling whatever. They're, they're not on the front line. Even the, the girls in um, the Peshmerga, the Peshmerga are the fighters of, of Iraqi Kurdistan. They're not really on the front lines. The only women that I've seen, that I've actually seen on the front lines fighting like that, door to door, sniping, they are these girls, trained by the PKK. And they are, the training camps originally, before the war in Syria, were in Kurdistan, in the, up in the mountains of Iraqi Kurdistan. And, and then the old fighters from the mountains of Iraqi Kurdistan, because remember, they waged this insurgency in Turkey in the 80s and in the, the 90s, it was, like, it was an important thing, it was a 30 year war. And then the commanders came down from the mountains and they trained these new recruits and so I've never seen women on the front lines like this. You can see them in different positions in the rear, but never right there. And as soon as they started to um, do the, the noise, you... The tlili, they call it tlili in, uh, in northern Syria, yeah. Did the the ululating, yeah. Did they stop? Well, they, it's psychological. 
you know it's a, a lot of it in war uh, has to do with psychology right. and projecting fear ISIS is really good at projecting fear you know all their propaganda and the videos and the beheadings on social media all the gruesome stuff is about projecting fear the women when they found out that they were scared of of women because they wouldn't get, go to paradise, then they realized, you know, that suddenly they would do spontaneously. They start doing this on purpose, and the, this is actually the way they kept the front line. They saw me in um, in Kobane, which was quite yeah. like da smart. Yeah, well, intrepid and fearless. Yes. I mean, a lot of them died. You know, yeah. It was like no one spared them anything. The beheadings and the torture and the rape and. You know, yeah, it's real, it's war, yeah. The first of which um, is the question of whether or not ISIS can also replicate the same model of using female fighters, um, and why not? Um, is it because of religion and that the fact that they don't have this Marxist ideology that the Kurds have? Um, and the second question is, um, there's a saying that goes like, um, one man's terrorist is another's freedom fighter. So one, man, what? Sorry? one man's terrorist is another's freedom fighter. Yeah. So in that case, like, who would consider these girls terrorists if in any capacity they are terrorists? Well, Erdogan, Erdogan, the president of Turkey, definitely considers them terrorists. Um, you know, terrorism is a label applied by governments to people trying to get rid of them. And very often, um, <laughs> and I'm talking about a war zone, hmm? because then, of course, it's used in many, many different ways. And Professor, you know, is more than I do. Um, so, Erdo why does Erdogan consider them terrorists? Because they're fighting for their rights that were long denied, both in Turkey and um, Syria. Well, I'm not talking about Kurdistan, Iraqi Kurdistan, because in Iraqi Kurdistan they do have autonomy. They run their show. It's a different picture. And so Erdogan would definitely consider them terrorists. I personally um, think that they're doing what they think they ought to do to improve their lives, yeah. um, which are very, very, very tough. And so they are my heroes. But don't tell that to Erdogan. I was wondering, you, you said that there are women commanders, right? And you met them. Yeah. So what is the attitude of the men in their ranks? Because coming from such a patriarchal society, one wonders how would they respect the authority of women on the battlefield? They do. It's, it, it is, um, the, the reason why at the beginning I shared my uh, surprise and incredulity was because this was actually real and happening. I did see a male chef, a male guy cooking um, for both male and, and female, and the commander was a female. You see, everything is about ideology. Everything is about whatever people are trained to believe. An ISIS fighter is trained to believe that he's going to get the virgins if he dies on the, battle, on the, on, on, uh, in, on the battlefield. These uh, fighters, both male and female, have none of that. They, their ideology, and what Ochalan tells them, is they're equal. And they should be equal both in war and at peace. And Ochalan is their god. Is a secular god, but they do have this cult of the leader because the pictures of Ochalan were everywhere. There was one girl, one Kurdish woman, one Kurdish fighter, I really liked her too. She showed me her journal. It was so pretty. She was writing a journal every day at the end of the night. It was a, it was a, it was a, it was a tender moment actually because she wanted to take a picture of me and to take a and she had their AK-47 and in order to take a picture with me, she handed me an AK. <laughs> and I'm like, it's not happening, you know, I'm never going to wear an AK to take a picture. It's like, this is, and, and, and I showed her my notebook and the pen, and I said, this is my AK, this is my weapon, and I said, I'm not wearing that. And, and then she said, ah, oh. 
And she left and she came back with her journal. And she was writing her war journal every night on the front lines. <laughs> and in the end, she was writing revolutionary greetings. And somewhere in this thing, I got the whole translation. I, I took pictures of the whole journal and then had translated because, for, of course, it was in Kurmanj, it was in Kurdish. And so it was all these revolutionary greetings and, and, and it should be a book because it was, it was really beautiful. It was this naive retelling of our daily lives on the front lines. And every day there was something about Ochalan, you know, Ochalan, our leader. Ochalan says this and also, so you, you, can, you can say that ideology plays a huge part. And then it all depends on what, on what you tell people, you know. What, and then people use whatever they need. And in this case, I think, in that kind of context where religion has become this po poisonous weapon, to have a secular force, actually, it's not bad. Speaking of the men in the photos, I was wondering where do these men come from and like, how do they get involved? Or, the men? Yes, the men in the photos, unless I missed that being answered already. <laughs> The men have a less, uh, uh, they have a more straightforward uh, Syrian story, meaning that the, the, that the story of the, the Kurdish fighters in Syria are more, is more similar to the stories of the Arab fighter, the, the, the Arab Syrian men fighting in Syria. They were the butcher, uh, the honey keeper, the maker, uh, the shop uh, owner, uh, the teacher, you know, um, they, they, they were part of their society doing whatever it was that they were doing and then ISIS invaded them because if you remember the front line that I showed you at the beginning when ISIS occupied Mosul and Raqqa both Mosul and Raqqa are bordering Kurdish areas they are Sunni cities but they are in Kurd heavily Kurdish areas so the moment they pushed to try to expand their state, they invaded the Kurds. And so the men, there was an uprising of the men who started, and then, and then these are societies where there is a gun in every household because they go hunting, because it's manly, because it's part of the culture and the tradition. So for the, for the male fighters, it was a more straightforward story. It was a story that I reported all over, uh, uh, across Syria. And of course, the ones, there was, was like a, a very famous sniper in Kobani, in fact, was uh, a guy who was a hunter. It was, everyone knew that he loved hunting, and then he became killed in Dash, and he became a hero because he had killed like 40 ISIS. I don't know. This is the kind of stories that, that you hear about the guys. But what was, Instead, much more interesting, it was about the women because no one actually expected the women to turn out to be these fearless, intrepid fighters, warriors, really, on the front lines. And on the other side, there are these bearded men, you know, and just like a bit creepy, yet they're doing it. What is it like for you um, operating as a female in your occupation in the Middle East, reporting on war? Um, just not even just with this, but more in general as well. Do you feel like being a woman yourself gives you more access or is it more restricting for you in your work? What I'm going to tell you right now is counterintuitive because a lot of people think that actually being a woman in a place like the Middle East or Afghanistan or wherever is actually liability. When in fact, it's actually an asset because it opens up, I have access to both men and women. And my male colleagues have only access, you know, the Kurdish women, as I try to explain, are an exceptional case. A very exceptional case, because here, of course, my male colleagues do have access to these girls. But in normal circumstances, male, my male colleagues do not have access to women in the Middle East. Forget about entering a house in Kabul or in Afghanistan or in Kandahar or anywhere. And I do have access to the women. The men consider me someone to, like a species to be protected. Again, I'm not talking about the Kurds because, you know, as I said, again, look at them. They're about to attack an ISIS post at noon and they're dancing. And they have music. <laughs> they're dancing, they have a, little, a small radio with music, okay? And ISIS forbids music, but anyway. So, 
the men, like there was a guy in Afghanistan at a certain point, I remember in Kandahar, he asked me whether I was half a man, why, you know, what was I doing there and why don't I go back home and take care of my husband and my kids? Da. Okay, but he was talking to me. But I was also talking to his wife and my colleague, the photographer, I had to wait outside. So, so it's, actually, it's actually a good thing to be a woman, I think. There are also moment, moments of pure humanity that come out that, that people do not expect. Like I remember in northern Syria, um, in Aleppo, three years ago, it was Ramadan. They were fasting during the day, during the daylight. They do not drink nor eat. And I was there and I was the only woman and we were in this dilapidated school and I woke up and I slept on the ground and like we all did. And, and then this guy, an old man, just took, brought me a cup of coffee. They were not drinking, no eating, but they had a the guest, a woman who was with them and there was his present and his gift. You see, it's not what it seems like. But they appreciate the fact that you show up and try to tell a story and they want to show it to you. Then there are the ones who want to kidnap you, of course, but you know. <laughs> the hope is to kind of steer away from these people, yeah. Um, I have uh, several questions, I have several questions. Um, my first question is what is the average age of those women who join, um, like at what age? And. Uh, um, also, do they realize how extraordinary they are in a way and how unusual the situation is of like female being fighting there? Like do they under, like realize how um, strange, like not strange, but how extraordinary this is? Um, and then another question after. Yeah, um, the commanders tend to be older in their 40s. The troops are, Younger, I've seen 16, 17, 18, 20 girls in their 20s. Um, so the troops are quite young. Average probably troops 20, in their 20s. Um, of course they do realize how exceptional the situation is. They wouldn't be dancing their, you know, the dabke um, on, on their way to attack ISIS positions if they didn't know how incredible this whole thing is. They, they were raised to be daughters and wives. As I said, they couldn't even go on a bicycle. They couldn't go out of their homes without a guardian, a male guardian. They, as, as they put it, they're, they felt like prisoners in their own lives. They had no rights whatsoever. And all in a sudden, in the most extreme circumstances on a battlefield, they're experiencing a certain level of freedom. Um, and and they, there is it sounds strange, but there, is, there was a certain amount of joy. The idea that even if they die, they're dying doing something that they really believe in. That their lives are not wasted as the lives of their mothers. This emancipation thing, they really feel it. And that was really striking to watch, to observe. As a follow-up on this, um, do you think if the situations, situation were to get stabilized there, um, would those women achieve to have like equal gender rights and or do you think it's possible that the situation would just go back to being treated as their mothers? No, uh, I think politically they uh, might obtain what they want in terms of autonomy in northern Syria. A situation similar to what the Kurds in Kurdistan, a bit less than what the Kurds in Kurdistan, Iraqi Kurdistan, are enjoying. But you see, I think the men they fought with were exposed to what these women are capable of doing. Politicized people who are part of this liberation struggle are definitely getting it. But change is very slow. So to tell you that the Kurdish women will be completely emancipated after this war, I'd be lying. I don't think that's the case because there are many other women who are refugees in camps in Turkey who are not exposed to this. But I think the seeds that have been planted there are robust. And, and I think it's very interesting to watch what will happen. Um, I was wondering if 
what you've seen with Kurdish culture and what you may know about the Kurdish history, that there's something in there that has, you know, made them adopt this fight against ISIS and Syrian refugees because you said that Commander Maryam was so moved by this attack and said we can't leave until we have a home here. And I know that, you know, the history of us Kurds, I mean, we lived to, through so much violence in the 90s, especially in Turkey, and that was one of the reasons why my father left. So I was wondering if there was anything in there, like in our culture, that you saw that... Totally. Yeah. Totally. I mean, the issue of displacement, and it's a bit like the Palestinians, you see. It's, about the, the, uh, it's a bit like the Palestinians who feel like they should not have fled their homes when the Israelis were attacking them. The, the, the idea of these people being dispossessed, of being their lands being Arabized uh, or stolen, or even in, 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 in Turkey, you know, the, the, the idea that in, in history they were moved around. And, um, and, and so now they are in one place and there is Genghis Khan approaching, you know, and you're not living. You're just dying, but you're not living. It's definitely in the psyche uh, of the Kurdish people. I have no doubt about this. And it's hardly surprising the fact that the backbone of the YPG, the, the protection units in northern Syria, is PKK, because they are so angry and pissed off. <laughs> but rightly so, I would say. Rightly so. You know, they, they heart it has been so hard and so harsh totally thank you for your presentation but my is not a question but i would like to add something i'm from turkey as well um it is true that uh, many of those women escaped from their lives from the patriarchal and federal society of kurdish nation i would call it nation even if there is no state um but it is all but I would like also add that Kurdish society is not homogeneous. There not, are, yeah. So there are Sunni Kurds and there are Alevi Kurds. Yeah. So this patriarchal oppressive society is not very um, same in every part of Kurdistan. That's true. Uh, so I think it, it is important to underline this because there are many women who participated in um, this cause Many of them, yes, escape from their lives, oppre oppressive uh, lives from their families, that's true. But there are many of them who had a political agency. So they knew why they, they were not just going there because they were escape escaping from their families, but because they knew that they would, they, would, they would go there just to fight for a cause. So it is not only the family thing, not the patriarch. It is not that because they are there, because the patriarchal families of Kurdish society, but because many of them had this really strong political beliefs and ideology. Yeah, the politicized, if I may, the politicized ones, I was talking about the fighters. Yeah, the fighters. I, yeah right? I'm talking also the fighters. Yeah, yeah. about the fighters. Well, the, in my experience, the politicized ones come from uh, a different level, uh, a different culture, different education. So they have different jobs. They're not on, on the battlefield. They're maybe in an office within the party and within the militia, within the YPG. They're there, they're part of the cause. And they come from, they have education, they have a degree. Okay, because I don't know if you ha have read about the um, Arzu Demir's uh, two books she, she wrote about like mm -hmm. this, and she was like interviewing female fighters, women yeah. fighters. So, and like this is what um, I read from like also these interviews, and they, they were like, like they were on the front line too. So. Just they, they they went there because and they were like having arms. They were not in the offices only. I mean, like they were also fighting and stuff. And also, I want, would like to also add something to your question, maybe. I think it is also true that in the very beginning, when also PKK was established, the fir when the first women went there, they faced a lot of problems from their male counterparts. That that's true. I mean, it was not like this paradise that women and male were same they had had to face and this is where we came today because women had to face and like gave a battle inside the movement too just to arrive at this point so it was not like yeah like today so yeah. it it, it like 
it, it's been like 20 or it more. It started in 30. 78. Yeah, so, so like they, they, they had to face a lot of problems also like in between the movement and their um, male um, fighters too. So just, just to say something about this too. Thank you. Thank you. If I'm not mistaken, earlier you said that these women take a vow of celibacy or they renounce sexuality as a precondition for adopting this role. Can you unpack that a little bit? Because that's, they're separating their sexuality from their gender and they're essentially being accepted in the world of men is sort of the way you explained it. But how does that work? Is that fluid? Do they go back? Do they, and, and it's, I think, I just wonder if you can yeah. unpack that ba a Basically, um, f one of the rules for them to become part of the, it's YPJ, it's the female unit of the militia, um, one of the rules is that they have give up love. Like they cannot have a boyfriend, they cannot have a husband, they're, they're, none of that. Uh, then if they leave the, the militia and if they stop fighting and they become civilians and they're no longer fighting and you know, then they can go, yeah, of course. But um, if they're do, if they're, and this, is, this applies to men as well. Then something is going on there, I'm sure. But uh, but but this is, <laughs> yeah. But because in war, you know, anything goes. You might die tomorrow. And, but, but but these are the rules, basically. These are these are the rules. Um, it's like uh, living a martial life, and um, they accept that. And and I think it makes sense. It's functional to the environment. It's so like in a, in a place like the Middle East to have men and women living together the way they are or training. I mean, the training actually, the training camps are in different places. There are camps for females and there are camps for men. So like the training is separated. But once you're, you're in the front line, you're sharing a, a, a space that is normally an occupied house or a trench or uh, a tent, you know, you're on the front line and you're together. And, and so in this kind of conservative environment, it makes sense. It's something very common in uh, national, nationalistic armies. Um, for instance, in, uh, among the L LTTE in Sri Lanka, they had the same rules. And they had women fighting front line and uh, committing suicide missions. So it's, you know, there, there are these cases that, that are attached to a kind of nationalist fight, right? Um, one thing that I remember reading about the LTT is that, for instance, women that were fighting, they actually were stuck to fighting in a sense because they couldn't go back. As you say, do they go back? And, and in, in, uh, in Sri Lanka, they couldn't go back to normal life because they became unmarriable. Because being in the army, in a way, had compromised the um, reputation as a normal woman. So do you have anything, um, any experience similar to this one from your we, Well, it's just one to watch because we have, um, in a place like Syria, this is completely unprecedented. The, the women with the regime in the army or in the police, especially in the police, they wear uniforms, but they're, they're far away from the battlefield and they do not experience anything like it. So there, there is nothing to look at to trying to understand what's going to happen. It could be that these women, having fought, might become an... What, what I think, having seen the camaraderie going on, is that they're going to end up with a fellow fighter. You know, they're, they're, they, it's, it, it's their lives and they're sharing so much. Um, how they're going to be accepted by the refugees, for example, so a lot of, most of the people in Kobane, so like, uh, in northern, across the north, you know, they crossed and they are in Turkey, in, in, in refugee camps. So the people coming back, how, how, they, they've not been exposed to this. How are they going to react? Probably they're not going to like the fact that they're, you know, that there are these women. It's going to be a process and a struggle all the way. Um, and, and this is the reason why I was talking about seeds um, planted earlier. 
I, I frankly think that for this course it would be very hard to go back to a situation where they're caged in a marriage with a man expecting to be the king of the household, you know? When will you be going back? Are you going to go back, and when will you be I, going back? I always go back, but I just, uh, I just found out that, I'm, that I got a visa to North Korea, so I, I thought I was going, <laughs> which was the strangest thing. I never thought I would get a visa for me, a photographer, to North Korea, so I'm going to Pyongyang. I, was, I, I wanted to go, I'm once again trying to get a visa to, to Damascus because I do want to go back to Aleppo, but I'm on a, on a blacklist of the regime in Syria. They don't like journalists who went in um, on the opposition side. And so I'm blacklisted. The Mujabarat, the Secret Service, um, has this blacklist. And so last time I tried to get a visa, they told me that actually they would like me to show up in Damascus and go to court and try me. I said, thank you very much. So I'm, I, I don't think I'm going to get a visa anytime soon. So I think I'll probably go to North Korea and then this looming Raqqa thing is going to be uh, happening. I don't know when. They said at the beginning of April. Of April um, I don't think it will happen, I, 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 I don't know. The Kurds are saying it will happen the first week of April, but the referendum is in Turkey on the 16th of April. The Americans have a huge problem because if they're using the Kurds to take back Raqqa, which is a Sunni city, Erdogan is going to be very pissed off. And if he takes, if he, the referendum wins, you know it's complicated. So I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. So I, I, I do want to try to follow Raqqa, because I've done a lot of stories in Northern Syria, I, I, I was in, I don't know how many times. So it's in my heart and it's something that I'll keep cover. But first Pyongyang, that would be interesting. Do you have any way of keeping in touch with those women? Yeah, I do, I do, through, because they only speak Kurdish, or some of them Turkish, or others, uh, of course, Arabic. And so, um, and, and on the battlefield, in the front lines, they do not have access to mobile phones, even though um, incongruously, Turk cell works <laughs> because it's on the border. And so you're somewhere in northern Syria and you do get roaming. <laughs> and so your phone works very well while everything is going crazy. But, um, <laughs> but um, I'm, in, I'm in touch with the commander, Marianne. Um, and uh, and then I also have my uh, my interpreter who gives me who gives me news of where they are, and a lot of them right now are actually encircling Raqqa, which is the the, the main battle. They, they're right there. They're on three sides, and they're basically waiting to launch this assault, and it's going to be kind of bad. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Then.